This morning we're going to start a journey through the book of Esther. And Esther is one of those books that um, it, it's kind of a puzzle as to, you know, why it's arranged the way that it's arranged and the, the things that happen in it can be puzzling to us, um, as well as the fact that not once in the book of Esther is the name of God mentioned. So it's a weird thing, right? Why would there be a story in here about people and, and not about God? But I think that when we look at the events that transpire about the things that happen in this story, we can see the hand of God at work, even though the name of God is not mentioned. The story of, of Esther is really a story all about power plays. It's really a story about power dynamics and relationships where people have power or they want power or they are under the thumb of power. And as we go through these stories, I want us to pay attention to what's happening there. I want us to pay attention to what happens in this first chapter that we're about to read between the king and Vashti, between the king's council and the king. Power dynamics between men and women. And as we read the, few, the, the coming chapters about conquered people and dominant culture, about the king and his subjects, the power dynamics between Haman and Mordecai, Everyone wants power. Everyone wants position because they think that by having power and position, they'll be safe. And that's what we all want at the end of the day. How many of us just really want to live unsafe lives? You just want to be insecure and everything, you know, not know where you're going to sleep, not know where your food's going to come from? No, of course not. We all have a deep longing to be safe and secure. And in this story, as well as when we look at the world around us, what we see are people grasping for things they feel like will make them secure. In this story, it happens to be power and position. As we look around us in the world, sometimes it can get discouraging and we think, oh, it's worse than it's ever been. I've heard that a lot. I don't know that that's true. <laughs> I don't think that's true. And as we, as we read this story, I think we'll see things were pretty bad at different points of, of history. You know, things were, were pretty bad for the children of Israel under the Babylonian captivity. Things were pretty bad if you were Queen Vashti in the house of King Ahasuerus. Things were pretty bad if you didn't have power. And it remains that way today. Things are pretty bad if you don't have power. Things are pretty bad if you don't have money. It, things are pretty bad if your life isn't secure. So we can see God working in the lives of people who don't have power, in the lives of people who are a conquered people, and using uh, what would have probably been considered the lowest of the low on the power and influence totem pole, the life of a young girl, unmarried, living with her uncle, an orphan, that these, this, this is the person God chose to redeem God's people, to save God's people. And that's why her name's on the book, because she's the hero of the story, the unexpected hero, the hero that we would not have picked, but that God picked. So let's pay very close attention as we read through this story together. Moments where power is being discussed, where it's being fought over, or it's being manipulated, envied, or used for good or for evil. We're going to read chapter 1 of Esther. If you want to follow along, I'll read it. You follow along. Esther chapter 1. This happened in the days of Xerxes, or Ahasuerus. It depends on what translation you're using. So don't worry, we're in the same book. The same Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. In those days when King Xerxes sat on his royal throne in the citadel of Susa, in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all of his officials and ministers. The army of Persia and Media and the nobles and governors of the provinces were present. 
while he displayed the great wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and pomp of his majesty for many days, 180 days in all. What a party. <laughs> what a party. Boy, we think that, you know, we see on, on television something happening on uh, Jersey Shore or The Real Housewives or, you know, some telenovela that they had a party that lasted for days and days and they were all drunk. 180 days. 180 days. For what purpose? Just to show off his wealth. Just to show off his power. Just to show off the pomp and splendor of his own majesty. Ooh, he sounds like a guy you'd want to get to know. I'm being sarcastic. I don't think I'd want to spend much time with him. Somebody who needs 180 days to prove just how marvelous they are. Verse 5 picks up, <clears throat> when these days were completed, the king gave for all the people present in the citadel of Susa, both great and small, a banquet lasting for seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white cotton curtains and blue hangings tied with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rings and marble pillars. There were couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of periphery, marble, mother of pearl, and colored stones. Drinks were served in golden goblets, goblets of different kinds, and the royal wine was lavished according to the bounty of the king. Drinking was by flagons without restraint, for the king had given orders to all the officials of his palace to do as each one desired. Furthermore, Queen Vashti gave a banquet for the women in the palace of King Xerxes. Everybody got a gold cup. Some translations say not one of them was the same. They were all different. They were all different. Can you imagine the time and the effort and the energy that the goldsmiths of the palace would have had to put into making different goblets for every person who attended? And not only were there different goblets for every person who attended, they said free refills for everyone. The drinking was by flagons and there was no restraint. Everyone was able to drink as much as they wanted. What a beautiful scene was set for a really, really drunken party. It's really sad to me because how long would it take with unrestrained drinking for people to no longer notice the couches of gold and silver or the tiled floor or the beautiful hangings? How long would it take before people were just so consumed with their own drunkenness that nothing else existed? How long till people were passed out on the floor? <laughs> they were in the middle of complete luxury in a scene of complete debauchery. It says in verse 10, on the seventh day, when the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Biztha, and Harbona, Bigtha, and Ab Ab Abagtha, Zether, and Carcas, the seven eunuchs who attended him, to bring Queen Vashti before the king, wearing the royal crown, in order to show the people and officials her beauty, for she was fair to behold. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command, conveyed by the eunuchs. And at this, the king was enraged, and his anger burned within him. So people had been drinking without restraint, no limits, free refills, for seven days. And the king says, I know what's a good idea. I will have the queen come and parade her beauty in front of all of these drunk people. Some people say that the king wanted her to wear the crown and nothing else. Whether, whether she had clothes or not, though, I'm not sure that it's dignified for the queen of an empire. Not just like the girlfriend of the warlord. This is the queen of the empire. Probably hand-selected to be his queen. 
probably from a noble family of much importance. And he's asking her to come and parade her beauty in front of a drunken mob. And she said, no, thanks. I don't think I'll do that. (laughs) No, thanks. No, thanks. It makes me wonder if the king would have requested this if he was quite so merry with wine. If he were sober, would he have recognized the importance of the dignity of his wife, the queen? Or would he have still thought that this was a good idea if he had been sober? I don't think he would have thought it was such a good idea. I'd like to give him the benefit of the doubt. But she says no, and in his drunken state, the king was enraged. He was enraged. He wasn't just miffed or annoyed. He was enraged, and his anger burned within him. He had asked her to do something inappropriate, and she said no. And his response was, how very dare you? How dare you say no to me? How dare you say no? Picking up in verse 13, the king consulted with the sages who knew the laws, for this was the king's procedure toward all who were versed in law and custom. And those next to him were Karshena, Sithar, Admatha, Tarshish, Merez, Marsena, Memucan, the seven officials of Persia and Media, who had access to the king and performed the command of the king, Xerxes, oh wait, excuse me, who had access to the king and sat first in the kingdom. These are the guys who get to sit down while everybody else is standing up. That's an important position. It's an important position. According to the law, What is to be done to Queen Vashti because she has not performed the command of King Xerxes conveyed by the eunuchs? This was his question to these gathered officials. And it does not say they waited a week to sober up before they had this meeting. They were all there together because everybody was there together. And having been drunk for seven days, they thought it was also a good time to make new laws. It was a good time to discuss the laws of the land and the consequences for Queen Vashti and what she had done by disobeying the king. Verse 16 picks up, Then Memucan said, in the presence of the king and the officials, Not only has Queen Vashti done wrong to the king, but also to all the officials and all the peoples who are in the provinces of King Xerxes. For this deed of the queen will be made known to all women, causing them to look with contempt on their husbands, since they will say, King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she did not come. This very day, the noble ladies of Persia and Media who have heard of the queen's behavior will rebel against the king's officials, and there will be no end of contempt and wrath. If it pleases the king, let a royal order go out from him and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes so that it may not be altered that Vashti is never again to come before King Xerxes and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. So when the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout all his kingdom, vast as it is, women will give honor to their husbands, high and low alike." Right? Remember when I said power dynamics? (laughs) Power dynamics and power plays? Sounds like Memucan has some trouble at home. That's what it sounds like to me. Sounds like Memucan is worried that his own wife is not going to respect him and that maybe she doesn't already. And so what is going to keep her in line? Fear. Fear is going to keep her in line. Not earning respect, not acting in a respectful manner. But let's make this Queen Vashti into an example so that all women will know that if they don't do everything their husbands ask, even if it's undignified, even if it is sinful, even if it is wrong, 
that they also can be put aside. Let's make an example of her. This advice pleased the king and the officials. That's an interesting line. They'd been drunk for seven days. This sounded like a really good idea at the time. This advice pleased the king and the officials, and the king did as Memucan proposed. He sent letters to all the royal provinces in every province in its own script and to every people in its own language, declaring that every man should be master in his own house. Okay. We can talk about marriage dynamics and what configurations work best. But this is not a godly man making this declaration. This is a man who wants control. This is a man who wants power. This is a man who wants to be the king of his own little domain. And we've seen how that works in this story so far, right? <laughs> we've seen how well that works out for a man to be the ruler of his own little kingdom. Now, maybe some men, maybe some men are righteous enough that they could do that and choose to serve while in that position of authority. Maybe some men could do that, could be master of their own house, and everything could be fine, and no abuse, and no corruption, and no problems could happen. But let me tell you, probably not. Probably not. There's a saying that says, power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. What do we see with King Xerxes and the power that he holds in his hand? Is he a man who is serving his people? Is he a man who is looking out for the best interest of those who are in his palace, in his court, in his harem, in his family? No. He's a man who chooses to have 180 days of drunken revelry to show what a cool guy he is. And he's not alone in this. It's not as though King Xerxes is the only person to ever be in a position of power and authority and feel like they needed to tell everyone that they were in a position of power and authority. (laughs) Jesus talks about the rich men coming to the temple and blowing trumpets, having people come in front of them saying, look at this guy, isn't he wonderful, giving all of his money. It's just what power does just what power does. It's not enough to have power. We have to let everybody know that we have power. It's not enough. It's not enough to own everything and to rule everything if you can't have every last little thing you want. It's not enough. We'll see in the next chapter that when the king sobers up, he begins to regret his decision. He's like, oh, but I liked Vashti. (laughs) But I liked Vashti. And I think he did. I think he probably did like Vashti. I think he probably did like her. I think she probably was a good queen. I think she probably was a good match for him. Seven days of drunkenness, though, don't always make the best decisions. And when one's... declarations, when one's decrees cannot be rescinded, as is the case for King Xerxes. Once he's put a seal on it, once he's sent it out to all of the provinces, there is no going back. According to their laws, once the king had sealed it and signed it and submitted it, it was law forever. 
I don't know whether to feel sorry for Vashti or to feel like maybe this was a gift. Maybe it was a gift. That she was out from under his thumb. That she no longer had to be involved in the power plays of the day. That she no longer had to engage in that. He couldn't divorce her. He couldn't leave her destitute. She still was a queen, and she still was provided for. But now she didn't have to play the games. She didn't have to play the games anymore. She didn't have to worry that this was coming, because guess what? It had already happened. So for her, maybe this was a liberation. We see people in this story, and we see people making good choices and people who are not making good choices. Vashti made a good choice. She paid the consequences for it. But, you know, even if you make a right choice and you receive punishment for it, it's still the right choice. And just because you have power and authority does not make your choices right. When they're dead wrong. King Xerxes did not act with honor or dignity. He didn't act with kindness. He didn't act with any regard toward anyone but himself. And the same goes for his officials. (laughs) Nobody thought about others, only themselves. When you and I are in the world, when we see these power plays happening, we have choices. We can choose to join in the power plays, or we can choose to sit back and ask ourselves, how do we handle the power that we have? Every one of us has power over something. doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter if you hold an office or not. It doesn't matter if you're married or single. It doesn't matter if you're a parent or not. Every one of us has power. We have the power to choose what we do with our time. We have the power to choose what we do with our resources. We have power to choose whether we will act with justice and kindness and mercy in the interactions we have with other people or whether we will act from selfishness. We have those choices, and that's power. So we can join in the power plays, or we can step back and ask, how can I choose to use whatever modicum of power I have? to make a difference in the world. When we read, when Katharina read that poem last week about the woman of valor, the repeated refrain at the end was, a woman of valor makes the world change. A woman of valor makes the world change. And I would say, a person of valor, woman or man, a person of valor can make the world change from whatever position they find themselves in. Let's choose to follow the one who came and who gave up his power, who gave up his position, the one who came to serve. That's Jesus. If we call ourselves followers of Jesus, then let's follow that example that he's given us. Let's choose to act with dignity. Let's choose to make the right choices, even if it means consequences. Let's choose to let God guide us, even if it is in seeing what is wrong in the world and choosing not to be a part of that.